uh, as you all know, six years ago, uh, ISIS member entered Sinjar and began a campaign of destruction and terror against the Yazidi community in Sinjar in Iraq. The crimes they have committed against the Yazidi community uh, damaged our people in many ways. Uh, means Yazidis now have to uh, work very hard to recover individually as families and as a community. We, we require a great support from the international community uh, in this time of need. That included what we lack in safety and security, uh, homes, uh, trauma treatment for uh, genocide survivors and job opportunities for the Yazidis to rebuild their life again. We have hundreds of Yazidis uh, are still living in IDP camps six years after the attack. Also, we, we know that although Daesh is military defeated, but the threat of extremism and terrorism is not gone. Today, we will hear a variety of international speakers uh, to talk about what happened to Yazidis six years ago. Also, what must be done to help our people recover and some ideas about preventing this from ever happening again. The first, the first opening statement is a video statement from Ms. Karen Smith. Karen Smith, advisor to the United Nations Secretary General on the responsibility to protect. Uh, we will now play that video statement. Dear organizers, members of the panel, distinguished guests, dear participants, it is an honor for me to provide these remarks on the occasion of the anniversary of the horrific events that shocked the world six years ago. Let me start by expressing my sympathy and solidarity with all the victims, their relatives and friends who endured the terrible crimes committed by Daesh with its brutal and exclusionary ideology. In August of 2014, the call from those who feared what was imminent was loud and clear, but the response was muted. This was a resonant failure of our collective responsibility to protect populations from the most terrible crimes. At the time, my colleague Adama Dieng, the Special Advisor to the United Nations Secretary General on the Prevention of Genocide, and my predecessor, Jennifer Welsh, stated publicly that attacks by Daesh constituted grave violations of human rights and international humanitarian law that may amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. They alluded to reports of acts committed by Daesh that may point to the risk of genocide. Other colleagues in the UN system joined in the call to prevent further violations and to deliver justice for those that had likely been committed. At the time, through these and other calls, Indications that genocide and crimes against humanity were committed by Daesh were heard throughout the world. We learned that women and girls were being abducted, that sexual violence was used as a tool for war and intimidation, that religious sites and cultural symbols were destroyed, that innocent and vulnerable people, entire families, boys and girls, were fleeing their villages to find safety on top of Mount Sinjar, waiting for a rescue that did not arrive. Cruelty and death descended upon an entire people because of their beliefs. Six years later, justice remains elusive. The crime of genocide does not exist in Iraq's penal code, and Iraq has not ratified the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Iraq's legal framework, therefore, cannot fully investigate and prosecute allegations of the crime of genocide or crimes against humanity. The call of the voiceless today is a call for justice for what happened to them. While court adjudication is not possible in Iraq, steps are being taken to find, document, and preserve evidence. Without achieving justice, there is little hope that the Yazidis can feel secure from new threats if and when they emerge. Our collective responsibility to protect populations requires us not only to address the crimes of the past, but also to build a future in which there's no space for them. Justice is essential to building such a future. Moving forward together, however, requires more than criminal accountability. The most important components of recovery, peace and safety require re the social fabric of the country 
from the highest levels in the government buildings in Baghdad or Erbil to the smallest villages in Sinjar and Nineveh, where communities reside and neighbors go on day after day with their lives. This is in the hands of each and every one of Iraq's citizens. It has to come from the bottom up and it requires the involvement of everyone. This will not be done in one day in the same way that risks for the most vulnerable populations did not emerge overnight. We know that many of the challenges for the Yazidi and other communities in Iraq did not start with the emergence of Daesh, nor ended once this group was militarily defeated. The Yazidi still feel vulnerable. Not enough is being done to protect not just their linguistic, religious and cultural heritage, but their very physical integrity. Preventing further human rights, including atrocity crimes, requires addressing long-term grievances. Iraq must work to build and strengthen an inclusive society where diversity is not perceived as a flaw, but as an asset, and where all communities feel safe, and where all calls of concern are heard and acted upon. This is the basis for the prevention of future atrocity crimes. As is the case for all states in the world, this is a responsibility that Iraq adopted in 2005. All states also endorsed their responsibility to support each other in protecting their populations. Dear participants, the failure to protect is simply too unbearable. The cost of an action too high. It speaks directly to each nation and to each individual through the terrorized eyes of those who we honor today and those who are no longer with us. Let their memory redouble our commitment to work for a world in which there's justice for the crimes they suffered and where the terrible legacy of such crimes prompts each and every one of us and all of us together to take action to prevent any further occurrence. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ms. Paramela Patton, the special representative of the United Nations Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict. Ms. Patton and her office have been uh, vocal in support for Yazidis including visits to Yazidi survivors of sexual violence in Iraq and Germany. Ms. Patton, the floor is yours. Thank you. Six years ago, Sinjar was the scene of tragedy, a genocidal campaign of killings, rape, enslavement, and abductions, which triggered a massive displacement of civilians. We all recall how, within days of the attack, reports emerged of Daesh committing unimaginable atrocities against the Yazidi community, of men being killed or forced to convert, of women and young girls sold at markets and held in sexual slavery by Daesh fighters, and of boys being ripped from their families and forced into Daesh training camps. For the women and girls, a different horror awaited. Captured Yazidi women and girls were deemed to be the property of Daesh, openly termed sabaya or slaves, and sold, traded between fighters, or forcibly married. Daesh fighters held slave auctions both in markets and online, circulating photos of captured Yazidi women and girls with details of their age, marital status, location, and price. Yazidi women and girls were subjected to the most brutal sexual violence. I'm grateful to Free Yazidi Foundation for the invitation to this panel to commemorate this dark moment in Iraq's history. The extreme brutality waged by Daesh against the Yazidi community, especially its women and girls, must never be forgotten. Today, we remember those thousands of Yazidi women, men, and children who lost their lives, those who are still missing, and those whose, whose lives have been devastated by Daesh. This day is also the occasion to salute the courage and resilience of all those who face these atrocities with bravery. As we focus our discussion on recovery, the voices of Yazidi people, especially its women, cannot be muted. The primary way to ensure the recovery of the Yazidi people is through their full participation in Iraqi society at all levels. I would like to recall how in 2016, the government of Iraq 
signed a joint communique with the United Nations in which it pledged to ensure accountability for sexual violence crimes, as well as the provision of services, livelihood support, and reparations for all survivors, including children born of them. Although the pledge was made between the United Nations and the government of Iraq, that communique can and must also be used by Iraqi victims and civil society to advocate for its full implementation including budgetary and reconstruction resources to be devoted to their recovery. In addition, since the signing of the joint communique, the Security Council has enacted two important resolutions that directly bear on the issue of recovery. Resolution 2331, in which the Security Council acknowledged that sexual violence and trafficking in persons was used by Daesh as a serious international crime. The Council noted that all survivors of sexual violence and trafficking in armed conflict are legally entitled to assistance and services for physical, psychological, and social recovery, rehabilitation, and reintegration. The Security Council reaffirmed that the full recovery of sexual violence survivors, including sexual violence committed by Daesh, is necessary for the restoration of peace and must be backed by the full resources of member states and the international community. Last year in April, the Security Council adopted Resolution 2467, in which it further spelled out the importance for all member states and the United Nations to adopt a survivor-centered approach to addressing sexual violence in conflict. It stated that survivors of sexual violence must have an active role in decision-making in transitional justice, economic and political life. These resolutions of the Security Council are binding legal obligations, including in settings like Iraq. These resolutions cannot and are not intended to be mere words on paper. I therefore strongly urge you to use these resolutions to promote the recovery of your community. Recovery will also not be possible or sustainable without justice. Under Iraqi criminal code, Yazidi people have the legal right to file a complaint for sexual violence committed against them and seek restitutions from their perpetrators. Similarly, under Iraq's law on combating trafficking in persons, those who were trafficked and sexually exploited, exploited by Daesh have the legal right to access specialized doctors, legal services, in privacy and dignity, financial assistance, and shelter, rehabilitation, work opportunity, training, and education. If these legal provisions are not being implemented, there is an urgent need for robust joint, joint advocacy with both the government and the international community. And today, as we discuss justice processes, we need to examine whether all the laws that give rights to Yazidi victims to assist in their recovery are actually being used to its fullest extent. For example, there is a specific reparations fund for victims of terrorism that Yazidi survivors must have access to. In addition, the president of Iraq has also proposed a law on reparations for Yazidi. The draft law still requires extensive work it is therefore critical that the Yazidi community be fully engaged in the process of elaboration of this important legislation. That is why through the UN Action Against Sexual Violence in Conflict Network, I have funded through our partner agencies programs to aid in recovery and reparation. Reconciliation will also not be possible without robust efforts to look for the thousands of missing Yazidis and members of other Iraqi communities and reunite them with their families. The Independent Investigative Mechanism for Crimes Committed in Syria announced in February to the General Assembly that the evidence it collects on international crimes will also be used where possible to help support the search for the missing in the Syria conflict. We should expect no less in Iraq. Your community too has the right to know what has happened to their family members and the world must know the truth of what happened to your community. Lastly, we must guarantee that these crimes never happen again. And one of the ways to do so is to amend Iraq's legislation on sexual violence. It is unacceptable that under Iraqi law, 
it is still a defense to a charge of rape when the perpetrator marries the victim. This provision must be repealed on behalf of not only the Yazidi women and those who suffered sexual violence, but for all Iraqi women. The reality is that much remains to be done. Yazidi women have been at the forefront of efforts to galvanize international support for the fight against Daesh. Now that Daesh has been defeated, they cannot go back to the margins of society. Their courage and sacrifice must be honored for their full and equal participation in the public and political life of Iraq. This is the only way a reconciled democratic Iraq based on the rule of law can be rebuilt for the future. I would like to conclude by reaffirming my determination to work with the Yazidi community and all components of Iraqi society to support them in their path to recovery and their fight for justice and redress. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Patin. Uh, I now invite Ambassador Steve, Stephen Rapp to make his statement. He was ambassador at large for war crimes issues at the United States Department of State. Ambassador Rapp, the floor is yours. You're mute. Mute. Okay. It's, it's an honor uh, to be with, with all of you today for this sad commemoration of a date uh, six years ago. And when the leadership of Daesh announced and unleashed the genocide of the Yazidi people. Daesh is defeated, but as other speakers have said, much remains undone. The initial regional and international response to Daesh was to fight it as a terrorist group, albeit a powerful one that had taken control of a large part of two countries, to launch military offensives to push it from its territories, target and destroy its leadership, detain those surviving members who could be captured on the battlefield and, uh, and then try them as members of a terrorist organization. We certainly thank the sacrifice and the blood of those who fought and defeated Daesh, but this is not enough for the Yazidi community that experienced 73 earlier genocidal attacks in their history and will likely face such attacks again. It's not enough for the survivors who require justice, which renders public decisions about specific crimes, the cruel and brutal killings, the depraved acts of sexual violence and enslavement, the intentional infliction of serious injury on a whole community, the individual crimes, but also the crime of crimes, genocide, the intention of which was announced to all the world. It's also not enough for the perpetrators. Counterterrorism trials allow them to present themselves as martyrs, persons punished for carrying out a religious edict. Their conduct, their individual conduct, needs to be shown as cruel, selfish, and perverted of a kind not ordered or condoned by any religious tradition, particularly one that emphasizes tolerance and mercy. What needs to be done? One, we need a universal recognition that this was a genocide, not the hallmarks of genocide, not an attempted genocide, not several other crimes and maybe a genocide, but a genocide the crime of crimes, like we established through judicial notice at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. I know that in my own country and in my own government, it took a year and a half of debate and then finally a congressional mandate to be, for it to be called a genocide by the American government. And that recognition, though it's been made by, by parliaments and other bodies around the world, is not yet universal. It needs to be so. But we also have to, to know that recognition under the Genocide Convention requires certain things. And as you can see it in the title to that convention, is a convention to punish and prevent the crime of genocide. Punishment means fair and complete trials, 
the next panel uh, today will we'll talk about uh, what's being done to accomplish it. And certainly people are very working very hard to that end. But far too little has been done to actually bring it about. I want to salute our colleagues in Germany, uh, the, the head of their prosecution unit, uh, Christian Richer, uh, for bringing a genocide case in Frankfurt, for bringing other cases against uh, Daesh members for the specific conduct against the Yazidi people and others. But why only there? Why only there? 2,000 miles away do we have trials for genocide. The Genocide Convention was ratified by Syria, Iraq, Turkey. Indeed, the International Court of Justice has told us that it is universal law. There's strong evidence against hundreds of individuals in custody in Iraq and in detention in Syria, and of many leaders or serious offenders known to be in Turkey that could convict them of genocide, that could convict them as well of crimes against humanity and war crimes. This is documentation that's been gathered by Yazidi groups, by other civil society and non-governmental organizations acting in a very professional manner. And also then finally organized, collated, and cases built by, by UNITAD uh, under the leadership of our good friend Kareem Khan. That evidence is there, but what we need is now trials for genocide and for the specific war crimes, crimes against humanity and the other crimes of violence. Then of course we need to repair the injury and restore this community. Because if it is not, it shows that they can get away with it, that they can partially accomplish their goal of destroying a people and a whole community. Today, we have 200,000 Yazidis still displaced, maybe 150,000 back in the, in the homeland, without the, without the services, without the rebuilding, without the assistance they need to truly build, rebuild this community and, and rebuild it stronger. And particularly to provide it for protection protection so that when this is attempted again, it can be prevented. Nothing else can be considered to be meeting the responsibility that all of us bear in the international community. And we can't say that we have done with those of us, uh, and I'm supported by Naomi and as a fellow at the Holocaust Museum, and, and our cause is, is the cause of never again. Sadly, a cause that hasn't, and a promise that's not often been kept. Let's do it this time. Let's have justice. Let's repair and restore this community and, and prevent genocide against the Yazidi in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I now invite Nicolette Waldman to make her statement. Nicolette is a researcher from, for Amnesty International, and we had hosted her not long ago here in Hanke. Uh, she has written some important reports about Yazidis, and uh, including Yazidi children. Nicolette, the floor is yours. Thank you, Haywan. Um, I first wanted to thank the Free Yazidi Foundation and my co-panelists. Um, it is a true honor to be here. My remarks today will be focused on an Amnesty International report that was released last Thursday, which is called Legacy of Terror, The Plight of Yazidi Child Survivors of ISIS. I first want to discuss how we carried out the research, and then I'll go into some of our key findings. So the research for this report was carried out between January and July of this year. And in that time, we interviewed 29 Yazidi survivors taken captive by ISIS as children, 25 family members who care for those child survivors, and 68, 69 other individuals, including staff members of NGOs, government officials, UN officials, doctors, psychologists, and psychotherapists, journalists, a representative of the Yazidi religious leader, Baba Sheikh, and other experts. So today I will cover two groups of findings. The first focuses on challenges faced by Yazidi child survivors, and then the second covers the situation of children 
born as a result of sexual violence by ISIS members. So in terms of child survivors, when ISIS attacked the Yazidi community in 2014, they abducted or killed thousands of children. Since then, hundreds of these children have returned to their families in Iraq, but these homecomings haven't marked the end of their suffering. What we found is they are facing massive challenges. First, in terms of their physical health, as a result of starvation, torture, sexual violence, and being forced to endure or participate in armed conflict, many child survivors now have long-term injuries, illnesses, or conditions. Girl survivors of sexual violence suffer unique health issues, including traumatic fistulas, scarring, and difficulty conceiving or carrying a child to term, where boys who are forced to fight for ISIS are especially likely to suffer from serious health conditions or physical disabilities, such as lost arms or legs during fighting. In terms of mental health, we found that these children are facing a mental health crisis. Almost every caregiver interviewed for this report said that the mental health of the child survivor they looked after had been affected by their time in captivity, in almost all cases, severely. Of course, each child's situation is unique, but mental health experts interviewed have found some patterns. They find that the most common conditions experienced by Yazidi child survivors are post-traumatic stress, anxiety, and depression, and some of their most common symptoms are aggression, hyperactivity, flashbacks, withdrawal from social situations, recurrent nightmares, and severe mood swings. In terms of language barriers, many child survivors return to their families unable to speak or even understand the Kurmanji Kurdish dialect when they return, which is spoken by the majority of their families. In most cases, these children speak Arabic as their primary language because that was the language spoken by their ISIS captors. This loss of a common language with their family member members can pose a serious obstacle in their reintegration. And finally, in terms of access to education, these child survivors face particular challenges in returning to school as they've almost always missed one, or in most cases, several years of schooling during their captivity. So some programs have been established to reincorporate them into the education system by providing accelerate, accelerated learning programs but many, many child survivors are not registered in these programs, either because they are unaware they exist, or in most cases, because these programs can only be accessed by dealing with very burdensome levels of bureaucracy. So second, in terms of children born as a result of sexual violence by ISIS members, I first wanted to go into a bit of background. As a result of ISIS's policies of systematic rape and sexual enslavement, Yazidi women gave birth to hundreds of children during their captivity. And due to religious, societal, and legal pressures, these children have, so far, largely been denied a place within the Yazidi community. The Yazidi community's response to this issue has been mixed. While many in the community oppose accepting these children, others would be willing to accept them, especially if they were given a positive signal by the religious authorities. Still others feel a great deal of compassion and sympathy for these women and children and believe they should be supported, but given the edicts of Yazidism, they cannot see a place for them within the community. Women have responded to the situation in different ways. Some have willingly separated from their children. Others have remained in IDP or refugee camps or with their ISIS captors to avoid being separated from their children. Still others have separated from their children against their will. I just wanted to say a few things about this third category of women, because in the course of our research, we found that many Yazidi women have been pressured, coerced, or even deceived into leaving their children born of sexual violence behind. And they have also been falsely assured they could visit or reunite with them at a later stage. All of the women we interviewed who were forcibly separated from their children said they did not have access to these children or any way to receive news about them. They also said they were unable to speak with their families or their community or just to speak publicly about their desire to reunite with their children due to fears for their own safety. Every woman we interviewed who had been forcibly separated from her child or children born of sexual violence pleaded for the national authorities and international community to act with urgency as they found their situations unbearable. And many of the women who we interviewed who were forcibly separated from their children had attempted to commit suicide once or multiple times. 
So in light of these findings, I just had three recommendations that I wanted to, to highlight. We are calling on the national authorities in Iraq and the international community first to provide substantial funding for programs and reparation schemes that address the health, psychosocial, educational, and other needs of Yazidi child survivors. We are calling on the national authorities and international community to assist Yazidi women with children born of sexual violence to reunite with these children if that is their preference and to prevent future separations of these women and children in the future. And finally, we're calling for the international community to prioritize and fast track those Yazidi women with children born of sexual violence who wish to reunite or remain together for resettlement or humanitarian location in third countries. Thank you. Mute, hey one. You're on mute. Thank you everyone for your statements and your solidarity with us today. Uh, I will now turn over the floor to Naomi Kikler, director of the Center for Genocide Prevention at the US Holocaust Museum. She will be moderating some questions and answers for the panelists. Miss Naomi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Haywan. Very much appreciated. I'd like to say hello to everyone who is participating today and to the Yazidi community. Thank you for allowing us to join you today on what is an incredibly somber moment for you and your community. Uh, it's an honor for all of us to be able to talk to you, for those in Hanfi and Sharia who have returned to Sinjar and for the hundreds of thousands who are around the world in the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and elsewhere. We know that today is a day where your hearts are, are pained, where you are thinking about your loved ones. There's not a single Yazidi family that has not been touched by what happened on August 3rd. And each of you know that what happened on August 3rd is part of a long history of your community being targeted over and over and over again, simply because of your religious and ethnic identity. So for today's discussion, we thought that what we would do is we would talk about recovery, but talk about recovery in the context of prevention. As we've heard so much from your community, you seek the desire to be able to return home, yearn for help for medical assistance, mental assistance, given the incredible trauma that you've experienced, the ability to have jobs, livelihood, but also very much a desire to live free from fear of future attacks. So if we think of recovery and think of prevention as being core to recovery, what does that actually mean at the international level, regional and local level? And so with that, I wanted to start by turning to Mario, uh, representing the Office of the uh, UN Office of the Prevention of Genocide um, and speaking on behalf of Karen Smith, who did the opening statement. Uh, Mario, your office in June of 2014 was the first to issue a warning of the risk of genocide when ISIS attacked Mosul and then moved very swiftly in a three month period across Nineveh, uh, finally attacking Sinjar on August 3rd. During that time, they drove 800,000 people from their home and essentially eliminated uh, millennia old communities of ethnic and religious minorities in Nineveh. The vast majority of Yazidi, Christian, Shia, Shabak, Kakai, and others who mm -hmm. still remain displaced from their homes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what Karen mentioned around the importance of warning signs and what some of those warning signs were in the context of the unique vulnerabilities that these minority communities faced and what the international community and local authorities should do when they see warning signs today, and if there are those that you are concerned about. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Naomi, and let me add my, my word of solidarity you know, and the, the honor that, that it is to be, to be part of this panel and representation of Smith. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Ms. Smith was referring, was referring basically warning signs from, from the perspective of her mandate on responsibility to protect, which essentially calls on all states to do something the early warning signs. In the case of, uh, of the terrible event six years ago, um, 
warning signs were there. They were evolving quite rapidly, that's also true. There was a fair amount of uh, confusion uh, amongst us in the international community on uh, to what extent the information uh, was evolving. Uh, but at the time, uh, the two special advisors uh, on the prevention of genocide at Amadien and on the responsibility to protect Ms. Jennifer Wells decided that it was important to essentially connect the events on the ground to the, the, the crimes that we're talking about. No? Genocide, uh, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. Uh, in terms of the reaction, I mean, you know, our, our manual answer to that, if you allow me the expression, is obviously that all states <clears throat> need to do whatever they can within the realm of their possibilities to do something about it. And as Smith was saying, it's, it starts with the state of Iraq. Of course, the state, the state itself was challenged and was under attack. So one could claim that at that moment, the responsibility uh, lay uh, more strongly within the international community. But uh, um, I think it's important now, as we're commemorating this, uh, and perhaps also referring to some of the points that uh, the, the rest of the panelists have mentioned, to look forward and do all we can to, to prevent the, the next the next genocide. No? And there are a number of things that uh, Adama Dieng, Special Advisor on Prevention of Genocide, has alluded to when he has visited the country. He's done it twice. He went in uh, November 2015 and on March 2020, so that was on the first week of March, on both occasions, he had the opportunity of hearing directly from a number of uh, uh, families, relatives of uh, victims. And it, it, it was very clear to him that there's a short dimension to all of this, and the panelists have alluded you know, to the existing ongoing concerns in terms of addressing the consequences of what happened six years ago to this day. But then there's obviously a longer dimension of this. And, and on that, uh, the international community and the state of Iraq had, have a lot to do. Ambassador Rapp made a very eloquent point in favor of justice, but it's for the sake of justice itself, but for the sake of justice as a tool of prevention. One can claim, very rightly I think, that the Security Council of the United Nations stepped up to the plate, established the mandate of UNIDAD, which in our view is doing a very good work, also liaising on doing outreach with the communities, which is quite central for us because we prioritize not the centrality of victims. But you know, to this day, the crime of genocide does not exist. Iraq has not ratified the Rome Statute International Criminal Court. As Ambassador was saying, there are fantastic efforts going on in Germany, but how about Iraq? You know, it's quite essential that the state takes that step. Um, we know that the Prime Minister uh, presented draft legislation to investigate international crimes, but that, is not a, that was in November last year, I think, but that was not adopted. That's where we are at the moment. There's other pieces of legislation that could uh, indicate you know, that, the, that the state wants to take the protection of serious. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a draft legislation on use of the survivors, survivors that there's a, there was at some point late last year, uh, draft legislation presented to parliament on uh, protection of diversity, which was adopted. Uh, perhaps most important, there's a constitutional uh, article 125 of the constitution that calls for uh, legislation uh, to establish uh, on the administration and sorry, the administration of political, cultural, and educational rights of all minorities in the country, that has not happened. For us, you know that that um, taking those steps would be important, not just because of the outcome that could result of those steps, but just for the very fact that it would demonstrate these things as to other communities in the country that the state cares about them, that the state cares about their protection, that the state is committed do all it can to, uh, to be a you know, diverse state and to, to ensure that uh, you know, what happened six years ago does not happen again. And the state can do that by liaising, working with victims, making victims central, central, uh, a central element of this effort, no? as G. Patton was mentioning before. All of that is quite essential. And you know, for us, responsibility to protect means this. It also means that the international community supports the state of Iraq in these things. Again, I, I want to refer to the work of Special Advisor Karim Khan, which is receiving a lot of international support, and including by the government of Iraq, by the way. And that's, that, that demonstrates how things can be done. But we need a little more leadership, we believe. And uh, from the side of, uh, of our office, all possible engagement with Iraqi authorities uh, leading towards that, uh, those sort of outcomes uh, would be prior. So, uh, okay. Thank you so much, Mario, and, and thank you just for your, your very frank honesty about where the international community um, has 
student solidarity, but also where they have failed. I think for many who are, are watching this from within northern Iraq, you are now in your sixth year of living in tents, wondering whether or not you have been forgotten. Um, and I think that what the panelists here are in their combined statements uh, and through our Q&A showing is that there are many people seeking to try to elevate the attention, but what we really need is continued international political leadership and the support of the government of Iraq and the Kurdish regional government to truly affect change in the way that's required. And sadly, that is not always easy to muster that coalition of sincere leadership. With that, SRSG Patton, I wanted to ask you about how you view and your office works on the prevention of sexual violence and conflict for vulnerable communities. Uh, EZD women, there has been considerable work that has been done to, to show how they were at heightened risk prior to the attack, how one could see through the, the rhetoric of the self-proclaimed Islamic State that they might face unique vulnerabilities. In such situations, what steps can be taken to protect and going forward, what needs to be done to prevent future attacks against women and girls? Yes, thank you so much for, <clears throat> for this question, because currently uh, when, I, when I took office, I uh, set two, two, three strategic priorities for the mandate. Uh, and the first one being prevention through, uh, through justice uh, and accountability. Uh, because for me, we, we keep saying that, and I, and I strongly believe that sexual violence uh, is not an inevitable byproduct of war. It's not collateral damage. It is never an accident. So it can, it is preventable. And, and, and there are many ways to, to, to prevent it, including addressing its root causes, uh, which is gender inequality, marginalization, uh, poverty, uh, structural discrimination amongst others. And just to mention that currently uh, I'm working on a, on, a, on a prevention framework that will be adap adapted to, 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 to different countries and different conflict settings. Because I think uh, we, we really need a, a very holistic strategy when we talk about, about prevention and, and have a, a framework. And, and, I, and I really think that we've been addressing uh, uh, sexual violence mainly the symptoms uh, and, 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 not, and not the root problem itself. And we have focused a lot of attention on, on risk reduction, uh, but I think there's a distinction between risk reduction and primary prevention. And, and, and for that, we really need to, to, to have this holistic approach, working with communities, working with uh, uh, survivors, and uh, working with a range of stakeholders, from uh, ministries of gender equality to, uh, to, to ministers of justice, but also national human rights institutions, community leaders, youth leaders, uh, uh, religious leaders, for example, in, in, in Iraq. Uh, we, we have been doing this, I mean, at the United Nations, we, we, we have been focusing on prevention. Uh, but with, I think what we really require at this point is a, a, proper, a proper framework. And I cannot uh, uh, emphasize more the need for justice and accountability. Uh, I think we have to make it, it cannot be costly to, to, raid, to sexually enslave uh, women and girls, but also men and boys without any consequence. And I, and I think what has made sexual violence such as a powerful tool is because of the impunity around it. And I think perpetrators know that victims do not report such crimes on account of stigma and a series of, of, of other reasons, fear of reprisal, lack of confidence in the justice system, amongst others. So it is a calculated uh, risk that we take uh, and, and it becomes a very effective. So we really have to create an environment also. And that's why the office, my office has been dedicating a lot of attention in, in addressing stigma, in, in working with survivors, in having this survivor-centered approach, in better understanding the needs, experiences, and wishes of survivors, putting survivors at, at, at the forefront, and creating this enabling environment for survivors to, uh, 
to, uh, to report. But also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the legal framework, and, and many uh, of the panelists have actually mentioned legal framework, and I'm just referring to the uh, uh, statement made by Stephen Rupp. The legal framework is, is, is so critical. And I'm uh, very pleased that Nicoletta shared with us the, the, uh, the research, because, for example, uh, it has been in my advocacy since I took office, uh, advocating for children born of sexual violence that last year with resolution 2467, for the first time, this policy gap uh, was, was recognized and, and, and uh, resolution 2467 recognized that children uh, born of sexual violence and their mothers have rights, both under the CEDAW Convention and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And as uh, you may know, I also have to submit uh, a report by, 20, by the end of 2021 on the plight and rights of those children born of, of sexual violence. And Iraq will be an important uh, uh, country for, for, for me to address all the different facets of, of uh, uh, survivors, uh, children survivors, uh, and, 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 their, and their mothers. So uh, I, I really look forward to working with, with all of, of you. And, and I think uh, when we commemorate this dark page of Iraqi's history, what we have in mind is that yes, it never happens again. And for that, we really have to work together on a prevention framework. Thank you. Thank you so much, SRS G. Patton, and just want to thank you and your remarkable team for all of the work that you've been doing really tireless in especially trying to engage the local governments in changing their approaches and changing the legal structures, as you said, to help protect women and children. Uh, it's not easy work, uh, and I think it's really commendable, especially the emphasis that has been put on uh, giving voice to survivors themselves and allowing for their voices to be heard in international fora. Uh, that's something that tragically is not done uh, as common course all the time. So we very much appreciate the approach that your office has been taking uh, and also in elevating concerns around the extensive documentation, the behavior of journalists at times in how they interact with survivors of sexual violence and at times the, the lack of ethical um, approaches that are, are used by those actors. So thank you very much. Ambassador Rapp, um, as always, you made a very eloquent argument around the centrality of advancing justice to tackling impunity and preventing future uh, scenarios whereby these atrocity crimes might happen. And underpinning that is the notion that we can actually change the behavior of potential perpetrators by showing them that there are consequences. And for many people watching, they will have lived with experiences where their loved ones were attacked prior to August 3rd, uh, where either individuals were physically attacked, belongings were, were stolen, and no one was there to arrest, prosecute, investigate. So they have lived in a, a world in which there is an absence of the, the rule of law. One of the challenges that you raised and SRSG Patton raised um, and Karen Smith raised was the approach that has been taken to charge individuals with acts of terrorism versus for the more specific crimes, be it sexual violence, murder, torture, and of course the ultimate genocide or even crimes against humanity. Can you speak a little bit to just how critical that is to creating a prevention framework? Well, I think it's, as, as I said, it's important to recognize these, these crimes for what they are and, and the conduct for, for what, it is, what it is. And uh, I think of the example in history of, of, of even the, the Holocaust, we had the trials at, at Nuremberg, uh, but frankly, the crime, the, the crime of crimes there that was pushed in, to the fore was aggression, a horrible Nazi aggression in, in Europe. And to some extent, the crimes against humanity, uh, against the, the Jews, six million killed, we didn't have genocide yet. Uh, uh, we're, we're kind of a second thought there, but we, we look back at some of that testimony as, as so profound and powerful. Uh, but it was really only in Germany in the 1960s, 15 years later, when a, when a, a state prosecutor, uh, uh, Fritz Bauer, uh, started uh, cases uh, uh, for the crimes committed in Auschwitz uh, against the German commanders, Germans prosecuting Germans, that I think the, uh, the lesson and, and the prevention uh, really, really took over and Germany became a country that uh, uh, is leading uh, injustice and where no one envisions these crimes uh, happening again. 
Now, the whole situation obviously is, is, is different in Iraq, but the thing that, 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 that I see here is, uh, you know, the international community um, uh, came together on this resolution. It took a year to negotiate uh, for, for UNITAD, uh, and it was very careful to try to keep the consensus, and that is a challenging thing these days. Look at other situations like the Syrian regime or the Myanmar regime. You've got the regime in power that's responsible for so many crimes. So obviously, and, and they have protectors at, at high levels in the international community, so there's no justice. Well, Daesh doesn't control any government, doesn't control Baghdad or Reveal or, or anywhere. So why can't we uh, move forward? And I think it, it, it calls for, for people to, to engage and, and develop ways, uh, uh, even on a smaller scale, that we can begin uh, uh, challenging this and, and, and building uh, that, that message that this wasn't just like often gets characterized after conflict, suffering on all sides, and it's it's kind of forgotten until until the next one. We need we need specific justice. Um, I mean, for instance, I mean, uh, even if it were reveal uh, 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 in the Kurdish region uh, or government of Iraq, Kurdistan region regional government, or or the Syrian Kurds uh, working to develop a, a hybrid uh, a court uh, with with international partners that we could begin to see, uh, uh, we'd have to find safe locations, uh, uh, but we could begin to see uh, uh, justice for these, these crimes. And, uh, and people could see the, 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 the horrible uh, individual crimes, uh, uh, the, the depravity, uh, the selfishness, the cruelty against men, women, children. And, and they could see that those that have suffered. And, and uh, as, as, as we heard in, in, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Nicole's presentation, uh, you know, that suffering needs to be to be brought to the fore, and while these survivors can still testify, so we need to begin that 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 process. And just defeating the group, just allowing, just having trials in which you're a member of ISIS, yes, uh, well, you're either going to get a life or a death sentence in in, in Baghdad. You're going to get so many years in Western countries uh, without any participation uh, for the victims, I don't think sends us the kind of message that we had after the Holocaust eventually about the horror of these crimes and the kind of thing that that's then internalized and, and understood uh, so we don't have a, a 75th uh, genocidal attack against the, uh, against the Yazidi people. Thank you, Ambassador Rapp, for that incredibly powerful reminder. Uh, Nicolette, your statement and presentation touched on an incredibly difficult set of subjects um, about the most vulnerable of the vulnerable, crimes perpetrated against children, the trauma experienced by children. And I was wondering if you could just reflect on how you understand that concept of prevention as it pertains to providing assistance to children and also to their inclusion in society that you touched on. How does that help us to create resilience and potentially uh, help to prevent future cycles of violence as well? So <clears throat> these uh, child survivors of ISIS captivity, um, something that I, I heard a several times from them, even at the age of nine, 10, 11 years old, um, up, to, up to 17 was they were demanding for justice and accountability. Um, that was their priority. Um, and not just justice and accountability for the highest levels um, of ISIS, but for the people who did whatever, hap whatever who carried out whatever abuses um, were carried out against them. So the direct people who, who, um, who made them suffer. Um, and I thought that was incredibly inspirational. Um, and I also really um, could sense how this group of children, probably some of the most resilient um, children in the world um, had such potential to not just be included in back into the community and be welcomed back, but actually would be, could be uh, leaders in their community um, and in their country and in the world. Um, so I think this is part of why uh, we really wanted to bring a focus to these children um, to not um, uh, make the mistake of losing this this generation um, of children. Um, and I think it's also why the lack of international support and national, but particularly international support for this community has been so disappointing. Um, because 
it, it, it really, um, some, one of the, the former child soldiers told me all he wanted was just a shoulder to lean on, someone to, to listen to his story and know that, that what, what had happened was wrong. Um, and it's just that kind of um, long-term, I mean, first of all, the acknowledgement, but then also the long-term support that is doable. These are, we're talking about hundreds of children. Um, uh, so it, it is very possible. And I think without the, um, the addressing, without addressing what these children have gone to and acknowledging it, bringing them back into the fold, it will be very hard for recovery to happen in a, in a full way and for these children's calls of justice and accountability to really be realized. Thank you so much, Nicola. And as you said, um, these are children who um, were either born into the environment fortunate themselves in or who were kidnapped and taken against their will um, and thus have so little agency, but it's quite poignant, his desire to just be heard uh, and as someone to, to lean against. And hopefully uh, we as an international community can help to support Haywan and others who are doing the hard work on the ground to provide that type of assistance. Maybe just in conclusion, um, I liked your reference to building the, the next generation of leadership within the EZD community. Haywan and so many affiliated with uh, FYF are part of that process. Uh, and it's a, a real honor for all of us to be able to be here uh, and share the platform with you, Haywan, uh, and with PARI and the entire FYF uh, organization. So thank you for all of your work. Uh, and thank you to the panelists um, and to everyone watching. Uh, we stand in solidarity with you on this incredibly difficult day and endeavor to continue to try to put an international spotlight on the challenges your community faces. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. I think the audience and especially the Yazidi community appreciated everything you've said today. And uh, of course, uh, we're all in this fight together as we try to support a community that is recovering from a genocide. So thank you very much.